as we come together, let us now rise for the entry of God's word. Thank you, Trevor. As we remain standing, shall we sing our opening hymn, hymn 525. 525, the church's one foundation. to worship this morning comes from the second book of Corinthians chapter 4. We read verses 8 and 9. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verses 8 and 9. One of our favorite scripture at home when we reflect on this we just see things and heavens opening up. It reads as follows. We are pressed on every side by troubles but are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Friends, this scripture talks to everyone sitting here and those who are not here. 
There's a time in our lives, it could have been this past week, when you felt that the skies were caving over your head, you were pressed from all sides. There, was, there were moments in our lives when we were confused, perhaps not knowing which way to turn. Perhaps there's a time when you just felt that even the taxman is after you, saying, hey, when are you paying over your, your taxes? Then you feel there's a moment when you find yourself running because something is chasing you from behind. You're being hunted down. Sometimes you just feel helpless and hopeless. You just say, ah, oh, this fire, no further. Now, nah, oh Lord, just take me. This is enough. This is way too much for me. That's when you get knocked down. But here's the good news. We have come face to face with our Lord, our God himself, through his Son, and his Spirit is here. And the reason all these challenges have not affected you, instead, God has enabled you and me to be in his presence here today is because he's our God. And we are here to celebrate him. The one who is in me is greater than the one in the world. That's what the Bible says. So let us come before that God today in celebration. There is a beautiful hymn that says, forget about yourself and concentrate on him and worship him. I wish to invite you this morning to do exactly that. To do no less than exactly that. Saying, Lord, here am I. I'm here to celebrate you. Let me gaze at your beauty and just marvel at what you're doing in my life. Things that I see and things that I do not see. Let us come to that God in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace today, celebrating you, acknowledging your presence, accepting, Lord, all the promises that you've made to us, knowing that, Lord, it's not about us, it's not by our own might, it's not about our own intellect, it's because of your grace. You have journeyed with us over the past week and the past month and the past years, and you still brought us here into your presence, Lord so that we may blend our voices in glorifying your holy name, so that we may utter to you our prayers of thanksgiving for who you are and what you do in our lives, so that we may utter to you, Lord, the questions that no one is able to answer, and, Lord, to receive from you your blessings and hope and know that there's a future that lies ahead for us. Lord, we thank you. We think that you never give up on us, even if we followed our own ways and tended to listen to the desires of our own hearts. But you have never given up on us. But instead, O oh Lord, you open your arms and you have welcomed us into your presence now. We thank you, Lord. And as we do so, Lord, we want to invite you to look deep into our hearts and, and, rec and receive those prayers of thanksgiving which are given to you today thanking you for having brought us up into our, on our feet and you help us go through all these challenges that, have been, that the enemy has been trying to throw at us. But you've still stood in and helped us to stand. And we thank you now, Lord, in the silence of our hearts. Receive our prayers. Lord God, we acknowledge that when pressures mount on us, when we feel pressed from all sides, we tend to look elsewhere for help. We trust our own intellect, we trust our own bank managers, we trust our own relatives, we, we, we trust, we put trust on our horses and chariots and all the positions that we have. And in so doing, O oh Lord, we have caused you to be unhappy with us. There are certain things that we thought of there are places we went to. There are certain attitudes that we displayed. There are certain thoughts, Lord, that cross our minds that are not pleasing unto you. As we come before your presence this morning, O oh Lord, we ask that you search our hearts. And that, Lord, we, as we come to you to confess that we have not been diligent in the reading of your word, we have not loved as we ought to love, we didn't forgive as, ought to, as we ought to forgive. Lord, we didn't give as, uh, as much as we, as, as, as we ought to give. But Lord, your mercy 
abounds on us. Now as we come before your throne of grace now, he receives receive our prayers of, of, of confession, which we utter you to you in the silence of our hearts. Receive our prayers, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your faithfulness is greater than anything that we can ever anticipate. You have invited us to come to you to confess our iniquities because you are the God of second chances. You are able to cleanse us. You are able to forgive us. You are able to restore us. As we come to you now with this prayer of, of confession, we thank you, Lord, that you have heard and listened to them. And you have assured us of, of your forgiveness that whenever we confess these, you are the one who will certainly remove those, those, those iniquities as the east is from the west. We now come to you, Lord, as a forgiven people. In Christ Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Let us now stand again as we sing together the second hymn which is found in number 79. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, 79, please stand.
Our reading this morning is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 7. We're reading verses 11 to 16. Once again, apologies, you won't see this on the, on the, on the overhead. My wife is going to read that. Thanks, my dear. Genesis 7, verses 11 to 16. Good morning. We read from Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 to 16. When Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all the, ground, the, the underground waters erupted from the earth, and the rain fell in mighty torrents from the sky. The rain continued to fall for 40 days and 40 nights. That very day, Noah had gone into the boat with his wife and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. With them in the boat were pairs of every kind of animal, domestic and wild, large and small, along with birds of every kind. Two by two they came into the boat, representing every living thing that breathes. A male and a female of each kind entered, just as God has co had commanded Noah. Then the Lord closed the door behind them. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, your word is alive and active. Your word is able to separate the soul from the spirit. It is able to go right between the marrow and the bone. And your word shall not return to you void without having accomplished that for which you had sent it. Speak to us now, Lord. We're listening. May the meditations of all our hearts and the words of my mouth be acceptable unto you, my rock and my savior. Amen. Friends, the story or the passage we've just read I'm sure many of us have read many, many a times from Sunday school days till right now. But if anyone were to ask you after this service, what is the message all about? Tell them one thing and one thing only. That we're talking about what happens when the door is locked. When the door is locked. We're picking up from this book of Genesis that it was a time of festivities. People were leading their own lives in their own ways and they didn't even care about God and the instructions and the um, commandments given by God. And even when they were warned that, guys, there's a big rain coming up. You better get yourselves ready to get on board. They didn't bother. But the most significant part in this purchase, which is the theme for today, is that after Noah had followed every instruction from building the ark all the way to getting animals and his family on board, the Bible says in verse 16, God himself shut the door, locked the door. Can you imagine for a moment those swimsters who believed in their own energies and their abilities to swim starting to swim towards the ark. Can you imagine having to stand before the door of the ark, knocking, hey Noah, come on, open up for me, calling even his sons and, 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 and daughters-in-law. Unfortunately, Noah didn't have the key. God had the key. Okay. Are we together so far? There's a time, therefore, when God holds the key. Let's ponder that aspect a little bit. What are the basic principles of a door? Why do we have doors in life? Number one, doors give us access to other chambers. You may have, like this door we have here. We're coming from outside, we had to go through that door to be inside here, to gain access into this place. Secondly, a door is there to separate or to divide certain rooms or even separating the outside from the inside. A door is there to provide security and protection. A 
door, remember, either has a handle, a key, or both. In other words, a door is meant to be lockable. Number five, you must also understand that you don't just give your key to any stranger. The one who has a key has to operate that door with authority given by the owner. Finally, a door. Did you know that a door is there and there's a time factor linked to a door? There is time to lock and time to unlock. And if that time to unlock has come, then you can have your access. But if that door is locked, it's too late. There's nothing you can do. If we can just keep in mind those six principles we have talked about, because they are going to assist us in understanding what happens when a door is locked. Again, are you still with me? Okay, good. The first part, therefore, is what happens when God holds the key? We saw exactly what happened in Genesis 7, 7 16, what we have just read now. But what happened in the Old Testament, in the, in the, in the book of Isaiah 22, verse 22, Isaiah was prophesying the coming of Christ. It, when it reads as follows, I will give him, God saying, talking about Christ, I will give him the key to the house of David, the highest position in the royal court. When he, that is Christ, opens doors, no one will be able to close them. When he closes doors, no one will be able to open them. And this is exactly what happened when Christ came. We'll deal with that in a moment. When Christ came, then he began to teach people all over the place. The Gospel of Luke 13, verses 22 and 27, to 27, have got the following teachings about locked doors and open doors. Jesus himself was saying, answering to people who were asking questions, Lord, tell us, are there any people at this church who are going to be saved? Are there any people in my family who are going to be saved? Are there any people in Port Alfred who are going to be saved? Are there any people in the UPCSA who are going to be saved? And Jesus answered them this way. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. And he goes on to say in verse 25, once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside, knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you and where you come from. Then you will start making excuses, trying to negotiate with him, saying, We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. Jesus, please. My name is Zola Kebeda. You know me. Then he says, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. We pick up again another very important aspect when God holds the key. We pick this up in the book of Matthew 25, verse 10. This is a very um, well-known passage of the Bible. You know the story of the ten virgins, five foolish and five wise. And I just want to pick up on verse 10 of that story in Matthew 25, 10. While the foolish five virgins had gone out to buy oil, the, buy, the bridegroom came in. And those five wise ones who were ready went in with, with, with the bridegroom to the marriage feast. And guess what? And the door was locked. When the foolish girl, the, the, uh, virgins came back, started knocking on the door. Open up for us. We've got some more oil now. It's our time to come inside, come inside. Jesus said, I don't know you. He had locked the door. 
because there's time to lock and time to unlock. Finally, what happens when God holds the key? Chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, verse 8. I know all the things you do and I've opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you obey my word and did not deny me. God now is saying, he holds the key. And when he opens that door, no one, not even the enemy, Satan himself, will be able to, to close. And vice versa. Isn't that wonderful? But then if it is so nice, so promising and so encouraging that we serve a God who is able to lock the door behind an enemy, then we feel protected in his presence. What about your role and my role? When you and I hold a key, what happens? The question is, do we actually have a key in our hands? Do we have a key in our hands? Let me just answer that question by simply saying, yes, you have a key. The question is, how come then your key doesn't seem to open all the doors of life that you want to open? How come that most of the time you feel pressed from all sides, you feel that, gosh, I cannot go on anymore. Yeah, you hear all those things, but yeah, it's not for me, but somebody else is doing better than I do. Because seemingly to you, the doors are not just opening well or wide enough. Let me make some indications as to why in our Christian journey, the doors that are in front of us do not seem to open with the key that has been given to us. If we read Matthew's uh, book of uh, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 18 to 20, there we pick up that it is indeed true that Christ has passed on that key to you and to me. Verse 18 and 19 read as follows. And I, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Yes, there you go. The keys of God's kingdom are in the human being. He has passed that on to us. The second book of Chronicles, chapter 7, confirms yet another, another part. When, okay, when God himself says, don't blame anyone else if the key in your hand doesn't open doors. You may be using a a wrong key to a, a right door or the right key to a wrong door. You cannot use a key for a padlock to open a, a door key, a, 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 a handle of a, of, of a door. So there has to be a match between a key and a door. You must know even the direction to which the door, door turns. Does it open that way or does it open this side? Is it a sliding door? Exactly what kind of door are we talking about? And what key have you got? Is it a remote control door? Here is what happens. These are things that stop the door from opening with the key that you have in your hand. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 13 and 15. Say, your sin and my sin are the ones that will stop that door from opening. Verse 13 says, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Turn from their wicked ways, from a sinful nature. Then I will hear from heaven and I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. So sin is the number one reason why the key doesn't open. Can't even open for the rain to come. Secondly, 
Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, the reason the door doesn't open with the key in your hand is faithlessness. When you do not exercise your faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who endlessly seek him. Therefore, you cannot hold this key without faith that is going to open. And say, so, oh, I just hope it's going to open. You don't even try. You must believe that the key is effective and it is for the same door that you want to see open. Number three, the reason the, door, <clears throat> the key in your hand doesn't seem to open is because of complacency. Complacency is when you are just too comfortable. You say, I don't have to do anything. Yeah, I do believe, I do have, I do have faith. But verse 26 of James 2 says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. An example that I've used before, let me use it again. <clears throat> if, and if you are thirsty and dehydrated, and on the verge of dying because of thirst. And I put this bottle of water before you. And I say to you, unless you drink this water, you're going to die of thirst. I say, oh, no, yeah, sure, I believe that. But you do not take an action. You do not open this bottle. You do not drink of it. What's going to happen to you? You're going to die. So faith alone without actions without deeds is not enough. That door which will cause that thirst to disappear will remain closed to you, right in your face, with all the help that you need, this bottle of water. The, the next one, <clears throat> which is recorded in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 27 and 29. The door that remains shut to you and me is unbelief. When Jesus healed two blind men and after they called out to him, Son of David, have mercy on us. What happened? <coughs> Sorry. Now I need that water. <coughs> Sorry about that. When these two blind men came to Christ, having heard their cry, he asked them one simple question. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. Yes. Unbelief can actually shut that door completely. In other words, I've, heard, I've seen, I've heard so many people saying, if it pleases you, Lord, may I be healed. If it pleases you, Lord, may I do this. If it pleases you, and yet the promises of God are yes and amen. Now, God is, Christ himself is saying now, according to your faith, let it be done for you. Because they've answered, yes, we believe, and they've taken an action and came face to face with him. The next one is this very sad one. Self-idolization. When you idolize yourself, you look at yourself in the mirror, you say, wow, I am so rich, I'm so blessed, and you forget about anything else outside there. You self-idolize. Um, this you find in the Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 2 to 6. Here is a story of a young woman from the story, you can tell she must have been pretty, pretty and young. She had a, a friend, sorry, sorry about that, a friend who had gone out, whether to work or something, but when night fell, she was cozy, she had put on nice pajamas and she was comfortable in her bed, and in the middle of the night, the friend came, knocked at the door, 
with the Jew all over the head, cold and probably hungry, and knocked at the door. And this, I remember uh, the words that this, this man uses, open to me my treasure, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. My heart is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. The young lady responded, I have taken off my robe. Should I get dressed again? I've washed my feet. Should I get them soiled? In other words, it's just so comfortable that she may not get up from her comfort zone to go and open the door for someone who's standing outside in the cold in the night. This is what happens when we self-idolize. We say, wow, I'm better off. Actually, I cannot um, open the door to someone else when in fact I need that comfort myself. So what is the solution? What is the solution? If any of these examples that we have shared today talk to you, relate to your own experiences, when you have not been able to exercise the key that's in your hand to unlock the blessings of God that are already packaged for you, ready, from time immemorial, what is the solution? First solution is found in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It begins by you inviting God to come into your life. Surrender everything. I have nothing to hide. Nothing is hidden from your face. I cannot pretend that you don't see what, is, what my weaknesses are and why this key is not working. Come into my life and help me move and change the way I think. Transform my thinking so that I may be able to use the gift you have given me to open doors of life, not only for me and for my family and the friends and everyone else whose doors are locked because you've got a master key in your hand when you've got Christ. The Gospel of Luke chapter 11 verse 9 gives us yet another, another um, opportunity to correct, match the key to the door. So I say to you, ask and keep on asking and it shall be given to you. Seek, and keep on seeking, and you shall find. Knock, and keep on knocking, and the door shall be opened to you. What happens is, very often, we come to Christ as if you're coming to an ATM. You punch those, key, those pin numbers, and then you turn your back and you go. And this is not the way the kingdom of God works. Christ himself is giving us now an indication that don't stop, don't give up. Seek, knock, and knock, and knock until that door is open. Yes, it is openable. And the key is right here. Keep knocking. Call on him. He is the one who has given you the master key in the first place. He goes on to say in Revelation 3.20 the one solution that is given us an advice he says behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears and listens to and heeds my voice and opens the door I will come into him and will eat with him and he will eat with me in other words Christ this day at this very moment right here is knocking saying hello the key is in your hand just let me in and let the rest, let me do the rest. Just open the door. So if you match the paragraph, the passage we read of Psalm 139, if you have something to hide, you're not able to confess it and you feel you are despondent completely, you will not say, search me. Now Christ is standing at the door, knocking, wants to come in and help you. 
If you do not, if you are not ready, you will shut the door and say, "I'm sleeping. I'm comfortable. Leave me. Leave me alone. I'll come next week. I still have a few things to sort out. I'm not ready. Let me try and tidy up my room first. No, 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 no. Time is now. Open that door. Reach out to the handle and let Christ into your life and see how things will change in your life. As we now conclude, when we have followed these simple instructions and advices given by Christ. He says, you now have the door to lock the enemy out of your life. He says this in Luke 10 verse 19. He says, I have given you authority to tremble on snakes and scorpions and to, to overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. So the moment you have that key in your hand, you lock the devil away. Your children, your family, your properties, everything will be protected because you've got the master key from the master himself. Isn't that wonderful? May God bless us. May God continue to encourage us to use those, those keys wisely for his glory. Now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your kind reminder of the ability that has been bestowed upon us. You have even given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to remind us about your teachings, to point us in the direction we should take. Lord, we thank you that we can now come to you knowing that we have the right key, the master key from the master himself, that we are locking away all the elements of darkness in our society drug addictions, violence, corruption, all things that are of the dark age, we are now committing it to the darkest part of, of, hell, of hell using the key that you have given us in the name of your Father, your Son and Holy Spirit, Father God. And as we conclude this service, O oh Lord, we call on, we look at the situation all around us. The war in Israel and Palestine the war, Lord, in, in Russia and, um, and, and in fact it has all the, to, to all the society in all the world around. We, we come to you, Lord, knowing that the countries all over the place are, are concerned about all that is happening all around us. We thank you, Lord, that you are in charge. You are in control. You have put men and women in positions of authority to exercise the key, to condemn all these efforts and all these activities that are not pleasing unto you, Lord. We pray for those who are victims, those who have lost their loved ones, those, those Lord, who have lost hope, lost their properties. Lord. We thank you that you are the one who is able to restore things back to what they are supposed to be. Lord, we come to you now as we are about to begin a new week that lies ahead. Be with Christelle as she takes time to, 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 takes time to, to rest. Be with all those that she's going to be interacting with throughout these coming days and, and weeks. We praise, Lord, praise you, Lord, that you are the one who has given her the key to, to moments of joy, peace, and happiness. We are your children, O oh Lord. We praise you for the men and women whom you have placed in positions of leadership at this church so that we may together serve you, Lord. Open the doors for your children who seek you, who seek your intervention. Lord, we thank you that you have got men and women in all churches, in all societies who are called by your name. And as they call on your name, O oh Lord, open the door. As you knock on their doors, Lord, we welcome you that we can be part of that witness so that we know that we have, we're have serving a living God. We thank you in the mighty name of our Lord and, and Savior Jesus. Amen. We shall now rise for the last time as we sing together uh, the closing hymn, which is hymn five four, hymn five four, in the S O F songs of fellowship. I am sh not sure. Okay, thereafter we shall have the we shall announce pronounce the benediction, and then we shall have the doxology, and then we remain standing for the exit of the word. May I invite you all at the end of this day to enjoy rugby. 
and uh, thank you and I trust that you'll have a blessed week ahead and uh, we shall see each other again this time next Sunday let us rise to sing uh, brother let me be your servant Take the key in your hand, save one another, and serve the Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, the love of God, our Creator, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, our Counselor and Advocate, be and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Joy